right. Our last discussion panel of the day, we're talking about aligning EVS with infection prevention. Let's break down those silos and get talking about important issues that are important to both of these groups. We have Dr. Green, Dr. Rock, and Amanda Valico at the podium. As per the usual, we'll have a couple presentations and a 15-minute Q&A at the end, and then we'll go to our workshop breakout sessions. The, the purpose of our panel, so we've, we've heard about disinfection um, and a lot of ins and outs about that. We heard even some more um, after we heard, had the lightning round talks, which were very, very interesting and, and enlightening for me. Um, so the, what our panel is going to do is to, is to talk about the alignment of, of the infection prevention with EVS or aligning EVS with infection prevention. Um, Dr. Rock is going to talk about the human factors engineering aspect and the systems engineering initiatives for patient safety um, and how that's applied to room cleaning. Um, she'll also talk about issues with accountability and better ways for monitoring and measuring um, cleanliness, however that's defined. I'll be talking about the disconnect between the requirements of EVS and what is actually expected of them um, and hopefully provide you some data that um, EVS is part of the solution and it's not just all hand hygiene. And um, Amanda, who is providing um, a, what I feel is one of the more, most critical aspects or perspectives is she's um, an infection preventionist that works in the hospital and she has been doing a lot of work with her team aligning her, um, uh, the, the EVS department within her hospital with uh, infection prevention initiatives. And so we will hear from her on how she engages their EVS department um, in infection prevention. Great. So our first speaker in the panel is Dr. Claire Rock. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine Division of Infectious Diseases at John Hopkins and an associate hospital epidemiologist also at John Hopkins Hospital. She is also a faculty member of the Armstrong Institute for Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety. How do you have time to be here? <laughs> I know. It's a challenge. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Golly. She's also the associate director for the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology Epidemiology of America Research Network and is a member of the Shea Research Committee. She has led studies published in peer-reviewed journals examining near patient environment contamination with hospital pathogens. And has done a lot of work on personal protective equipment and room exits and touching of near patient surfaces during patient care. Things we've been talking about today, right? The I'm not touching you because I'm in the room not touching you. <laughs> um, her main area of interest is the role of the environment and transmission of pathogens in the healthcare setting. Dr. Rock. Great. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks for the invitation to come here to speak. It's truly been a fantastic, uh, fantastic day with lots of great speakers and, and great interaction. So I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, but this is just really to bring back the... Um, the reason that we're here discussing about the role of the environment in prevention of um, infection transmission. And we know that the bacteria are getting smarter and smarter. They're getting more and more resistant to the routine antibiotics that we use. And so this is a true challenge for um, providers that are trying to treat patients with these resistant infections. And we know that there are the top five hospital-acquired infections where a great deal of um, hospital epidemiology and infection preventionist time is spent preventing central line-associated bloodstream infections, um, cowdies, which we heard from Dr. Saint earlier on, C. diff, um, a favorite of mine, a spore-forming bacteria that really resides in the environment, surgical site infections, and ventilator-associated events. And um, this costs billions of dollars annually to the U.S., um, and really affects hospital reputation and reimbursement, um, which really helps um, infection prevention and hospital epidemiology really get to the C-suite and hospital leadership for them to realize that there really needs to be resources um, given to hospital epidemiology. But let's not forget, there's associated huge significant morbidity and mortality um, with nearly 100,000 deaths per year in the U.S., I'm not going to labor this because really we've discussed it in many of the other, in the other um, presentations, but it just goes through the pathway of how bacteria are transmitted. And this is particularly looking at CRE, which we see certainly in our academic hospital, in our oncology and transplant units, and is really um, associated with very significant morbidity and mortality for our patients. Again, just looking at an outbreak that was in the NIH, where there was a massive outbreak of KPC, a type of CRE um, bacteria, um, which really had a residual um, component of being found in the environment. 
And this slide has been shared before in similar ways, but just saying that we know that the environment is contaminated frequently with all these drug-resistant um, bacteria. And these are the fomites, more the high touch, and interesting to hear the focus on the low touch um, surfaces, which really opens out the um, broad scope of infection prevention and environmental care associates. And we know that the environment, that the bacteria persist in the environment for many, um, for long periods of time. And also that a patient who is admitted to a room where the previous patient has had one of these multidrug resistant bacteria is at independent risk of acquiring the bacteria. And so really all the proof that we essentially need to say that the environment is playing a huge role in transmission of bacteria to these patients. And as someone already alluded to Phil Carling's study, we know that there's significant room for improvements because we know that less than half of the near and um, patient surfaces are cleaned appropriately. But this goes back to the question, how do we know if a room is truly cleaned or disinfected appropriately? And this is a challenging question. And so when we look at methods of monitoring room cleaning, there's really four different um, strategies that are used. The first and, and, and potentially the more, most basic is observation. So just going into the room, looking to see if it seems that it's um, clean. Um, this is obviously resource intensive to have every room every day uh, be assessed for, for, for cleanliness in a systematic way. And obviously it's easy to focus on the wrong things, especially when more and more emphasis is getting put on patient experience and patient satisfaction, which is truly how visibly clean a room looks, but really doesn't get at the um, potential for that room to be a source of transmission of bacteria to um, its occupant. Um, culturing is another, and someone mentioned previously about swab culturing of um, high touch surface sites. Um, and this has the advantage in that you can do um, a swab of a high touch surface inoculated in the microbiology lab, and it will identify the specific pathogen that's there. Um, but really, this is very labor intensive for a microbiology lab, and it doesn't give any immediate um, results. Um, and so you need the time for the bacteria to grow and identify. And so when you're looking at doing performance improvement in the hospital setting and how we can improve patient room cleaning, um, it's not really something that's feasible to be used um, in, a, in a true non-research setting. And then this moves us on to the two that are most widely um, used. The first is the um, concept of a fluorescent gel marker. And so it's um, basically um, citing fluorescent gel, which is invisible to the naked eye, on high touch surfaces or whatever surfaces you want to assess um, that are cleaned. And then some period of time later, normally 24 hours later, um, someone goes back into the patient room with a black light and shines it on the areas where the fluorescent gel was cited. And really you're looking for um, absence or presence of the um, fluorescent gel. So if the gel is no longer there, you can presume that a process of manual cleaning has removed the gel. Um, and so this really just gets at the process of room cleaning um, and the fact that it has been done, but doesn't give any information about the um, specific presence or absence of bacteria. Oh, and then the other is um, the ATP um, system, which has been previously discussed, but basically detects protein. And this can be any organic protein that's um, in the room or on the high touch surface and can include um, dead bacteria and live and live bacteria. So um, it's nonspecific um, and it's a, it's a challenge to use. Um, Ideally, if you were to use this system, you would want to do it before and after. So you'd want to assess what the ATP reading was before the process of cleaning and then assess it after and directly compare those two to see if you were having um, an effective um, clean to remove um, organic uh, debris and bacteria. But it gets more complicated than that. If, if for a hospital that's looking to instigate some kind of monitoring system to see what the level of patient room cleanliness is, um, it goes to the uh, level of who's going to do the monitoring. And so we know that there is um, significant um, effect when the monitoring is done by the same people that are doing the process of cleaning. And so um, we know with hand hygiene monitoring, like that's been so eloquently discussed earlier on, that if the people that are doing the monitoring are, are the people that are working on the unit, then there's a potential for some biased results. And so we can see a similar um, thing here when the monitoring is done by environmental care or facilities who are the group that's done, that's performing the, um, the cleaning. And so I think infection prevention um, has a role here to really get involved in a transdisciplinary approach with environmental care associates and teams to really help in this monitoring. 
And then the second is how are the, ro the rooms chosen? Um, there can be a convenient sample, so an infection prevention assistant will go up to unit and just pick whichever um, rooms they um, wish to cite the fluorescent gel. Um, but there's some issues with that because it has their own inherent bias of which rooms they'll pick. And so it seems that they're less likely to pick a room on contact precautions, which is a room that would require a gown and a glove and gloves for them to wear to, to enter the room. And really this is problematic because we know that the patients that are in those contact precaution rooms are there because they harbor one of the multidrug resistant organisms or C. diff that we're trying to prevent transmitting. Um, and then the other um, aspect of choosing the rooms is that often uh, preferentially unoccupied rooms can be um, picked by infection control assistants that are deeming to, to cite fluorescent gel. And so this can have um, problems in that it may not represent the true proportion of cleaning because um, rooms that are unoccupied for um, a significant period of time may actually be more likely to be um, cleaned better because there isn't the um, added interaction of the um, patient and family with the environmental care associate while they're doing the, the process of cleaning. And then there's the question about nights and weekends and which cleaning is really important. Is it the discharge cleaning? Is it the daily cleaning? Um, how do we choose the high touch surfaces and should we be choosing some of the lower touch surfaces that have been um, discussed earlier on? And was very interested to hear the modeling discussions from some of the earlier presenters because truly there's an opportunity for us here to um, look at some modeling um, aspects of how many... Um, uh, high touch surfaces in a room represent the room and how many rooms represent the unit when we're trying to think of a strategy in our large hospitals about implementing a monitoring um, program. And then the big question for infection prevention, what do we do with the data? And I think infection prevention has moved um, mountains in recent years in that we are far moved away from collecting our epidemiological data that we keep to ourselves and really don't push the, the boat out to do the performance improvement initiatives. So one of the vital things about this is feedback of the data. And so the data has to go to multiple people and it includes the frontline environmental um, care associate who can, who's the one that truly needs that individual feedback. And also to hospital leadership so that they can understand the um, problems and resources that are um, needed for a hospital. There's the question of accountability, which goes hand in hand with um, data feedback, but a need for retraining and re-education and um, essentially an accountability model of some sort of structure about what can be done for um, poor performers. And then also rewarding those that are doing well, so um, those that are able to um, uh, sustain a prolonged uh, period of keeping their high touch surfaces uh, clean. And so I'll just relate this, which is from our um, hospital and basically this is um, we use a fluorescent gel technique to monitor our room um, cleanliness and this is the um, data that we would present at our hospital epidemiology infection control committee which would be also shared with um, hospital leadership and basically what we um, do is um, aggregate the um, the um, denominator, which is the total number of dots that have been placed um, per building per month, and the numerator, which is the um, percent that are the number that are removed. Um, and here, what you'll see is them aggregated by month um, over over time. And I think the story that that I'll tell is is um, a story of improvement where we had this is a traffic light signal, so you can see that there was um, a lot of yellow and red, um, and these are arbitrary percents, right? Because we don't know what percent of high touch surfaces truly need to be cleaned or disinfected in order to prevent transmission of, of bacteria. But we took a cutoff of 90% um, for, um, for our green. And so this is just to demonstrate some improvement over time. But implementing change is complex. And anybody here that's infection preventionist or working with any team to try and, and improve performance will, will truly understand this. And it's really formed from many different components. And one significant portion of that is changing, changing the culture. And this is extremely relevant for environmental care um, associate teams. Um, and I'll just show you in some of the research that we've done, but the, the need for the environmental care associate to be part of the healthcare team and for their role in patient safety to be recognized um, is really um, cannot be um, overstated. 
And some examples of things that we've done is um, celebrate Environmental Care Associate, Associate Week with the concept of walk in your shoes and leadership talks. And this ultimately is the president of the hospital being teamed up with one of the frontline EVC associates and going to one of the units and just spending an hour with them to see what the process is that they do and really ask them if they've any problems that need to be addressed and really feeling like their voice is, is being heard. This is, um, speaking about the rewards, these are environmental care associates in what we call the 100% club. So these are environmental care associates that have done um, a training um, uh, a procedure where basically they um, got 100% of their, of their dots removed. And so this is to try and recognize and highlight the importance of the work that, that they're doing. And so one day a week, they wear these yellow t-shirts as a sign that they're truly high performers. Um, strong collaboration between EVC and infection control is truly essential. Um, and I think um, when it comes to meetings, unit meetings on um, with, with nursing and other healthcare workers, infection control and prevention truly need to, need to be the advocates for the environmental care associates and truly need to help work in a transdisciplinary way um, to communicate the needs of the EVC um, associates. Um, Monthly meetings between EVC and nurse manager are essential to really iron out any problems and address any issues um, up front, especially before things can escalate and confrontations um, can be seen on units. So a lot of these things are to try and um, prevent that type of scenario. And then engagement with service excellence, which uh, is done with many other groups within the hospital, um, but things like um, scripting and tent cards so that um, patients understand that their room has truly been cleaned, even if they did not see um, a, an environmental care associate in their room can help. But let's look at some novel approaches. And um, Sanjay alluded to um, some of these in his um, earlier talk, but I'm just going to talk more about the human factors engineering and how it can truly pertain to environmental care associates and their work. And so um, this is collaborative work that's done with between my group in um, hospital epidemiology infection control um, and also the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality, which really is um, an institute that brings together many transdisciplinary um, groups, basically with the focus of improving patient safety and quality. And so human factors engineers is engineering is the scientific discipline concerned with understanding of interactions amongst humans and the elements of the system. And it applies theories, principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and the system performance. And really when it comes to human factors engineering and infection prevention, it's an underexplored area and there's lots of room for um, human factors engineering type approaches to improve the processes of what we do in infection prevention. There was previous discussion about how it's been used to, um, to improve central line care and the assembly of the central line um, cart, and also in making gowns and gloves available um, in an easy fashion for um, C. diff uh, prevention bundle. But this is looking, this is um, work that we've published in infection control hospital epidemiology. And it's really putting the process of patient room cleaning into this systems engineering um, initiative. And what it, looks, what it looks at is the interaction of the work system with the process and the outcome. And you'll see in the work system, in the very center of the work system is the, the, the person or the people. And so there are many vested stakeholders when we think of the people um, related to, to patient room cleaning. We have the EVC associates themselves, and we have the patients that can get infected if this process doesn't all work well together and their families who deal with the repercussions. We have other healthcare workers and infection control and administration. And then we have their interaction with the different aspects within the work system. So their tools and technology, um, you know, do they have the cleaning tools that they need? It was alluded to um, very, uh, well, one of the um, earlier speakers about having adequate um, supplies and tools. Um, checklists can be helpful. Then their interaction with the organization, um, including that safety um, culture and the feeling of really being a part of the healthcare worker team. Um, and then their interactions with their tasks and internal physical environment. And then this all leads together to, to um, result in the processes, which is truly the, 
the room cleaning process or the process of other care areas. For example, a lot of attention been given to the communal areas, which certainly can be a source for um, residual bacteria and potential onward transmission. And then the outcomes. And the primary outcome that we're truly interested in is healthcare-associated infections. Um, but there are other uh, outcomes such as patient experience. And then there are the outcomes related to the employee outcomes. And this really all works back in, in a circle because if the um, employee outcomes such as motivation and satisfaction are enhanced, then turnover potentially is decreased and then training needs are, de are decreased. And really the, the model is more sustainable. And it really focuses on this strong concept of um, participatory ergonomics, which really just means involving the frontline um, provider in the initiatives that are made. And so for this, it's truly involving the frontline environmental care associate, the person who is act physically doing the, the cleaning and any of the interventions um, that are deemed appropriate to improve the, the process. Um, and what we did was some semi-structured semi interviews um, and also focus groups. And this is some of the results from semi-structured interviews that we, that we did. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll go through these um, relatively quickly. But this is a qualitative um, uh, uh, analysis of the interview that we did. And it divides the um, system into the work system elements the notes, which are the common themes, and then the quotes, which get down to what the environmental care associates were saying. And so you can see that there's, um, for example, motivation of the EVC associates was a common note that seemed to come up in many of the interviews. And you can hear someone here saying, thinking back to my first year, there were some challenges, I could not keep up, I could not motivate myself. And then the one that came out strongly again and again was empathy of EVC associates with patients. I treat you like my mother is lying in that bed. Yeah, I love my patients. They love me. I love what I do. I take care of them and I make sure that they are good. And it was very interesting in doing these interviews that those EVC associates that seem to feel that empathy with the patients seem to have some more overall satisfaction with the importance of the job that they were doing and the relevance they had to the organization. Um, tasks. Um, a typical day at work is sometimes fast-paced, sometimes slow-paced, and can be hectic with those doctors making rounds. You have to work around them. And so just interesting thinking about how the EVC associates are interacting with the other um, healthcare workers as they go about their teams. Nice thing that we heard when it came to teamwork was some mutual help between the EVC associates and um, that they were um, willing to help each other out when it came to certain tasks. But interestingly, to look at their perspective of other healthcare workers, and so it came up again and again about physicians, nurses, and a feeling of respect with the um, environmental care associates. And so we have a quote, physicians throw their gowns on the ground. So this would be in a contact precaution room where all healthcare providers will be wearing gowns and gloves. And we'll not pick it up, we'll not put it in the trash. Just clean up after yourself sometimes. I get you most of the time, but sometimes just make sure you make it to the trash can. Um, this um, came up again and again, but uh, tools and technology, and the big part that came up with this was really not having easy availability of um, supplies in order to go about doing their tasks. Um, and physical room um, layout. Thank you. All right, next up, Dr. Green. I, I want to start out by... Um, commenting on the 2020 Healthcare Associated um, Infection uh, targets that have been set by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, these are based on, uh, these are new targets set from the 2015 rates. So uh, by 2020, they'd like to see a 50% reduction in MRSA infections and in hospitalizations. And then um, they'd like a 30% reduction in our C. difficile infections and in hospitalizations. And in order for them really to achieve this, there's going to, we need to start doing something different. These are some, this is pretty big jumps. We've been, you know, we have huge efforts right now in hand hygiene, um, but we need to think about it uh, uh, perhaps a little differently. So um, we've, we've heard today a lot about direct transmission in hands, hand hygiene and its importance and then fomite, so Dr. Gerba, I did have fomite, you just got to it before me, um, in uh, transmitting um, the movement of pathogens in the, in the environment itself. 
And I had done some work trying to understand that actual transmission process, that the movement of bacteria from a particular surface and the skin. And then, um, you know, what were the different uh, factors that would impact the whether or not or that, that pathogen, how readily it would, it would move in either direction, either be picked up by the skin or deposited onto a surface. We looked at six different surface types, and that's called transfer efficiency, so you can, you can calculate that. This is published in the American Journal of Infection Control. And just to uh, give you a, just the basic take home message from this was that, you know what, hand hygiene really is important because your, the, your hands will pick up, uh, this is done for acetin, uh, acetin, acinetobacter baumannii, um, will pick up a baumannii four times greater than the deposit rate. Okay, so you're more likely to pick up from a dirty surface than you are to, dip, to deposit to a surface from your hands. So that tells us, oh, you know what, we need, to, we need to clean our hands. But we repeated it with gloves, and I'd like to point that out here. The middle one is with gloves on. So we did the exact same thing, same surfaces. Now we have gloves. And what's um, two take-home messages from this, from this data. Again, almost a 4% um, increase in pickup transfer efficiency versus deposit. So your gloves are just, they're going to pick up the bacteria more readily than, than deposit it. Interestingly enough, you know, there's some, there's some property similarities between, between gloves and hydrophobicity in your skin. Um, but the other one is that we need to change our gloves pretty frequently because there's still, bacteria are still being moved back and forth. And, and there is this idea that I have gloves on, I'm protected. And um, so I was, I was doing a, a, a short ethnography study. It's, it was in a dental area. And the, the woman put her gloves on, and she was in the mouths of the patient, and then walking over and touching the, the, the x-ray button with her gloves, and then back in the mouth of the patient, and coming back and touching that x-ray button. And it happened like 10 times, or however many times. It was a little girl. And you know, it's, it's just the idea that it's, the point I'm trying to make, okay. But I have to keep moving because I don't have time to talk. Um, and, the, and the other thing is, is that, yes, gloves do protect us to some degree because um, they, the, the reduction between, um, in, in pickup, for example, and deposit, the first blue bar and the first red bar, that's a 15, almost a 56% reduction in transfer or in pickup. Um, and uh, almost a 47, or just over a 47% uh, reduction in deposit um, transfer efficiency when you wore gloves. And when you had two surfaces that were exactly the same, skin to skin, the pickup and the transfer efficiency was the same. So what we did is we took this data because I found it very, very interesting. The reason why I even wanted to find out that data is because that's a parameter that's used in mathematical modeling to look at um, exposure assessments. We do exposure assessments. We can do fate and transport mathematical models. And um, that pickup and deposit transfer efficiency has always been something that um, we assume because nobody's done the, the research to, to calculate it. So now we have these numbers. So the next question was, well, how does this impact our um, transmission models? And would we come to the same conclusions? And so I'm not going to go. This, this study, uh, this paper is, is submitted and is currently under review. There is a lot of, a lot of information out of that study. But this was a piece that actually kind of came out that we weren't specifically looking for, and I find it quite significant. And that is, is that if you look at these, so the three different colors, there are three different uh, ways that you could run that mathematical model. So there are three different um, designs of the model itself. And it was just to look at uh, transfer of, of pathogens between um, the healthcare worker and um, a patient who is colonized, and a healthcare worker and a patient who is uncolonized. So when we look at the, uh, the x-axis down here, um, that is hand hygiene compliance. And the y-axis is the reduction in relative contamination. And the point is, is that you, you'll notice here for the healthcare worker, it never goes to zero. And that the return on investment in your hand hygiene campaign or your hand hygiene program really starts to diminish roughly around 70% or so. I know this is only one study. It needs to be repeated. We need to run this through other models, and we need, you know, it's not out of the peer review process, but it does give us uh, some, some, you know, something to, to hang our hat on in that EVS, or the, the environmental cleaning, is an important piece. If we put all our eggs in the hand hygiene basket, 
we will, we're, we're, we're not doing anybody any favors and we're not protecting our, our patients. And so as our panel looks to align EVS with infection control, um, the, I wanna talk about the HCAP scores. So there's a really heavy emphasis on the HCAP scores for EVS. And um, what those are, this is a hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and system hospital surveys. It's a set of uh, survey questions and it is a measure to um, essentially rate various departments in the hospital on patient satisfaction. And EVS has, uh, and other departments, are under a lot of pressure to maintain high HCAP scores. And I call this the EVS patient satisfaction, patient safety conundrum. They have a lot of pressure to achieve patient satisfaction with these HCAP scores. They have to achieve visual clean cleanliness. They have, um, you know, they get rated on was, was my um, garbage cleaned or was there a presence in my room today? Um, and was it quiet? So the quietness is part of that um, HCAP um, survey for EVS. I, I didn't, I was really shocked when I learned that. Um, but yet they get a lot of pressure from nursing and infection control to um, maintain an area that is contamination free. They, you know, when there, are, when there is an epidemic, it's this, you know, it's finger pointing. Well, you guys weren't cleaning well enough. Well, no, you guys aren't doing your hand hygiene. And you can't have one without the other, honestly, because in order to touch something, you have to have a hand. So the, the, it goes together, okay? Um, and, there's, and there's problems. Um, so, so, so EVS wants to, um, and they want to. I, I, I've been in, I've talked with a lot of the, the, the um, environmental service workers, and they have their heart into it. But they are seen as a cost center. So they're often um, losing FTEs, right? So, um, hey, if the hospital needs to start cutting budgets, that's one of the first places that happens, at least for the hospitals I've talked to. Uh, so, and when they lose their FTEs, they that means those people have to do more and less time. Um, another, another problem that they have to deal with is the need to balance that patient turnaround time with cleaning performance. And so once again, they're being measured on how fast can they turn, or to, turn a, uh, a room around? How fast can they get something done? And how, or how, how, how much can they satisfy a patient? But they're not at all being measured on how well did they clean and, and how well did they help us um, minimize uh, the, our, our um, risk for healthcare associated um, infection transmission. And this is just some examples of when you have um, a, a job that is, is when you have work force that exceeds the workload, workload that exceeds the workforce, sorry. Out of sight, out of mind, uh, you, they, I, I had one EVS uh, employee say to me, you know, by the time I get done cleaning and wiping down everything I have to do, I don't have time at the end of my day to go back and, and clean. No ownership, no responsibility, cows, wows, we already heard about that, right? It's not my responsibility, I'm not gonna clean it, that's an issue. ATP, that's the, just one last rule of comment. As far as ATP is concerned, I know that there are two camps. They love it or they don't. I'm not saying that ATP does not have its place, but it is not a measurement for contamination. It does tell you if somebody came and cleaned something, but it does not tell you, in my expert opinion, that, they're, that it's, it's contamination free. And I reach out to industry and I say to you, you know, help us come up with a method that is you know, um, effective or that, that can communicate to where it's necessary in your critical care ICU units. That's where our most vulnerable patients are. We need a method for, for our, our um, you know, infection preventionists to know that when they're putting the next patient in there, they're not increasing their, um, their, their patient's risk. Uh, ATP is great in areas where you have um, maybe hallways, wherever, lower, lower risk patients, but um, this, this other culture AT-based uh, method that does use ATP, it is a, it is, it is a step in the right direction, in, in my opinion. Um, happy to maybe have another conversation with anyone for it. I, my moving forward slides, I'm gonna skip, but um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Green. Our final speaker in this panel is Amanda Valico. She is the Director of Infection Prevention and Epidemiology for Michigan Medicine. She also received her MPH 
at the University of Michigan, and she has 10 years experience in infection prevention and is a board certified infection control and epidemiology practitioner. She's also a fellow of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. She works very closely with EVS at Michigan Medicine and is active in publishing her work alongside EVS and in a variety of other mediums as well. She had a joint paper at APIC related to the use of new disinfectants and their impact on C. difficile. Um, her team is also evaluating a variety of room disinfection technologies to determine how they can best supplement an HAI reduction program. Ms. Valico. Thank you. So first I want to say how lucky I am because at the University of Michigan I have a very strong EVS director partner who happens to be here today, Moritz Hughes, who's hiding out in the back. But, uh, <laughs> but we have, this is our work. This is the partnership that we've built and I'm going to talk to you about what has worked, um, some of our successes, and then some of the projects that we're kind of working on and trying to figure out as well. So first of all, um, we meet a lot. We have a lot of meetings because we have a lot of sort of irons in the fire at any given time. So Moritz and I are, uh, meet almost every other week and we typically have half dozen projects going at any given time. So it's always to kind of make sure things are moving and what do we need to do and troubleshooting issues and things like that. Um, in addition, we have a monthly partnership meeting that includes the two of us, as well as the EVS lead trainer and business analyst, and same kind of thing. It keeps the projects moving. It helps us troubleshoot issues in a reasonably timely fashion and make sure that the things that we're working on um, are able to move throughout. We're, we're a huge complex system, so uh, those of you at huge complex systems, particularly in infection prevention, know that it takes a really long time to implement things. So sort of staying on it, um, this, this has really helped with that. Um, another thing that has been one of our big successes is our C. difficile prevention work group. So we have a monthly multidisciplinary meeting, um, and this includes sort of the, the major players in C. difficile. So it's infection prevention, um, which includes uh, infectious disease, as well as environmental services, um, our microbiology lab, and of course, antibiotic stewardship. And then, of course, we have some clinical folks that join as well, like nursing and things like that. Um, that has really helped us to focus on the C. diff prevention efforts, and we sort of focus on those four areas, but that group gets together on a monthly basis to review the data, um, to look at things like the um, assessing the cleanliness of the environment and things like that, um, and then makes recommendations for the improvement efforts. In addition, with C. difficile, um, wh what we do internally is we have a weekly, we call it our weekly C. difficile email. And it goes out to the entire infection prevention department, but also to um, our EVS lead trainer who shares it with the EVS supervisors. And it basically lists all the cases of C. diff we've had over the last week, and it, it includes the unit, and it talks about you know, which ones are healthcare acquired. And we actually have a C. diff response plan um, that has certain triggers. So certain activities happen when, when there's a healthcare onset case, and then when there's you know, a number of cases on any particular unit and things like that. So that gets shared weekly and, and with the EVS folks with instructions on, okay, it looks like this unit had a healthcare onset case, here's the plan, that sort of thing. So regular information about that goes out. Um, and actually, Infection Prevention and EVS co-presented a C. difficile reduction abstract this year at APIC. We had implemented, in addition to all this, a new um, cleaning chemical that we saw some success with. So um, we were able to, to co-present that work, which was great. And it's also really great to be able to share that with, with the team. And you know, it was a chemical that we, we met some resistance with. And so showing sort of the group looping back and showing that this really did have an impact on C. difficile rates um, was really helpful. So other venues that we have where we connect with environmental services. So we have monthly supervisor meetings um, that myself or other infection prevention staff um, attend and present at or do Q&A at, at, at on some sort of regular basis. And there's also um, at least monthly staff educational sessions. So actually the frontline staff all gather in the same kind of thing where, where there is an opportunity for any hot button infection prevention issue to be shared. And we also really try to bring the data back to the staff. So for example, a huge goal for us, like everyone else, is hand hygiene. And so we'd been working on it with environmental services a great deal. We actually uh, made a video with our environmental services staff doing hand hygiene sort of in, in the areas where we had seen missed opportunities, so doing things the right way and the wrong way. And actually Moritz did a nice voiceover for it. I should have brought that video to share. Um, but that, so that was shared at the meeting. And then being able to go back to that meeting and show reduction in certain, in certain infections 
um, as a result of that, I think really helped tie it together and um, has helped kind of motivate people to continue with the improvements. Um, in addition, there are um, staff meetings on a regular basis for the various environmental services supervisors that are open, again, for uh, myself or other infection prevention folks to attend if needed. And they do um, staff huddles at, you know, at the start of every shift, so there's always opportunity to bring information if, if it's necessary. Another really successful thing that happens um, is what we call the partnership meetings. So um, the, the environmental services supervisors that cover specific areas have a monthly partnership meeting, and it typically includes the staff or, or the um, leadership from that particular area, as well as the infection preventionist that covers the area. And they go over the data for the room cleanliness and things like that and talk about issues, things that are going well. They often walk about the unit and things like that. Um, so I think it really helps to bring together sort of a team view of, of sort of getting that work done. <clears throat> so we always have tons of project work going on. Um, so I'm going to just talk about all these a little bit, but we're working on, uh, as I think we've talked about a fair amount today, how do you evaluate the cleanliness of the environment? And we certainly are um, open to hear, you know, what people have been uh, successful with. Also, the use of technology for room disinfection and, e and even product selection. So, um, so for evaluating the cleanliness of the environment, it's definitely something that we are um, doing quick improvement cycle um, tests on because we had, we had been long using ATP, um, knowing its limitations, but using ATP in some capacity. And we actually um, found that when we change cleaning chemicals, you know, as expected, it's different now, right? We need to rebaseline. So that's been sort of a challenge. It's already challenging to communicate the limitations of ATP data to people, you know? So that's already a challenge. And then and when you say, well, we have to rebaseline now, because our and, and it sort of seems like you're rebaselining because your numbers don't look good. But the truth is it's, you know, it's a different process now. Um, so certainly that piece of it. Um, we have looked at fluorescent markers too, and certainly they have their place to help with doing a bigger volume of rooms. Um, but again, it's you know not a perfect method of assessing the uh, cleanliness of the room. The other thing that we're recently beginning to do is look at various bacterial assays. So one of the uh, ones that seems promising is um, the pictures up there. I think it's called banana broth. But it's specific to C. difficile. And you swab the environment, and you put it in the tube, and you incubate it. I think you have to incubate for 72 hours to confirm a negative. Um, and then it, it turns a different color if it's positive. So anybody can swab, and anybody can read it. You really just need an incubator. Um, the downside is you have to hold it for 72 hours. So then you've swabbed, and somebody else is in that room. And then you say, oh, shoot, there was seed it there. So working out a process, um, what we're planning to do if we implement this is likely use a room disinfection technology you know, after doing that swab to at least feel that we've done something in the event that the C. difficile does grow. So looking at those things, but I think that's the big limitation with sort of the, the various culture methods is that you don't have that real-time feedback. And then when you have the results, it's not like you can hold a room. So there's already somebody in there and then you feel, uh, you know, concerned that there could be some sort of exposure there. So um, that's definitely a challenge. Um, and like I mentioned, with any of these methods, with interpretation of the data is huge. ATP is complicated, and it's, you know, you can't really get down to a, a you can say, oh, this number means clean and this number means dirty. So, so when you're presenting this or sharing this with others, it's definitely a um, challenge, and being able to sort of describe it and its limitations can be challenging. Um, the monthly dashboards are really helpful for presenting the data. So in addition to any kind of, whether it's ATP or swabbing or whatever that we've done, um, the EVS supervisors also have a robust rounding process where they're looking at um, certain elements in, in a certain number of rooms as well. So that kind of data is shared. Um, and then that information um, is often you know, presented up the chain to leadership as well on some sort of regular basis. <clears throat> The, one of our other big projects is looking at technology. Um, so challenges that we've run across, number one, are logistics. So um, census constraints are huge for us. We are always always like bursting at the seams. So um, depending on the technology you, you use, trying to get a bed held for a few hours to do a, some sort of treatment can be a huge challenge and, and sometimes is a problem. Um, the tracking process for being able to know 
if all the rooms that you targeted were done and things like that can be challenging as well. Um, and then just troubleshooting issues. Um, you know, if the machine is damaging the room or things like that are happening, um, kind of bringing the group back together to say, okay, what's the problem? Can we fix this? That sort of thing. So um, this is an ongoing project as well. And then product selection is always um, important. You know, we're always looking at standardizing, you know, it, it, a huge challenge, and someone else mentioned it, is the fact that you have all these different manufacturer IFUs and you end up with 100 cleaning products and it's way too confusing. So trying to standardize um, is very important. And then also just lastly, troubleshooting issues. This is sort of, I think, how we kind of come together as well when things like bed bugs come up or, you know, nobody's worried about CRE and things like that, but you see, if somebody sees a bed bug and it's like, every, you know, it's panic. So um, so we definitely work very closely. We, we actually partnered on um, a bed bug protocol and, and EVS has really taken the lead on dealing with those issues, which we greatly appreciate. Um, and then streamlining our process, our workflow, so that people can be successful at performing hand hygiene, so they're not coming out of the room 20 times and needing to wash their hands 20 times. And then finally, just being a liaison to other disciplines. Um, for those of you in infection prevention, I think that when I first started covering infection prevention when I got to the University of Michigan, one of the big things that, um, that, you, that I heard from my colleagues like once a week was, this department said EVS was doing X, Y, or Z, you know, like the, sort of like the tattletale or whatever, like they're the first to be blamed if there's like an increase in infections or like, well, I just don't think things are being cleaned appropriately. So I was able to kind of always dig into those issues and get to the point where I was like, wait, 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 you know, like uh, we, we really work closely and I know what the process is and the follow up. And so I can speak confidently that, okay, you know, this isn't the issue, you know, something else is. So I think that's been helpful. I don't think I have time to go into the roving equipment, so I will not. It's, a big it's dirty, though. No. Equipment yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we have time for about two questions, so make them good. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, great panel. Um, it seems like uh, it, through across all of it, there's a like a total. It's not the rebuild that I was arguing against this morning, but it's like a rejuggling of stuff. Um, the, the point that you've brought up, Christine, about totally perverse incentives, this is nuts. We're chasing HCAP scores with one force, and actually it's patient outcomes for the, for the quality side of things. This is nuts. Like We need to find a way to thread that needle much better. And isn't it, strikes me, an opportunity to start doing that, um, the stuff that uh, Dr. Rock was speaking about, Putting people on the healthcare team, taking EVS seriously and putting them on the team is taking them off of age caps and putting them onto outcomes. And I saw on your slide um, that it's a nurse manager that's doing this. Is this, I'm just spitballing here, is this time to reorganize around uh, the ID section doing this? IP is in control of EVS as part of an outcomes led initiative? Like we completely rejig our entire understanding of how the hospital is organized by thinking through like, whoa, I don't think we're, we're incentivizing the right way and maybe the right people aren't, aren't in charge of the right things. Throw it out there. Yeah, that was exactly my point, that they, you know, they are being held accountable to keeping the, uh, the patients safe and yet um, at the same time being held accountable to these measurements that have nothing to do really with patient safety. It has to do with patient satisfaction and um, time. So it's, I think, difficult. My comment is actually very similar. Um, metrics influences behavior. And I think you, you nailed that in terms of, you know, the example with EVS. So my question is, if we look at the reason why we're here, when you mentioned you know, Catalyst for Change as overall the terms of conference, and looking at innovative approaches, how can we use metrics to change behavior and enact some of these you know, um, different technologies or, or innovative solutions? And I would say, looking at the, um, the structure of the um, EVC associates, like what, what um, Dr. Leslie was speaking about, is really challenging and actually at our hospital we did have um, a different model where we had support associates who did the um, cleaning on the unit and they reported through nursing but that had various other um, other problems and so really it seems to me the core of it has to be the respect 
and whether the EVC associates are reporting to the, an EVC line or facilities line or reporting to, to a nursing line, it seems that if the um, respect isn't there in the culture of the unit, and the culture can be different on different units, um, then really um, it's extremely challenging to get work done without confrontation and really get effective work done. Do you figure it's a place where you can start using metrics in a different way though? Like, but I put up the whole, let's reorganize the whole hospital. That's just blown up for the last session of the day, why not? But do you think we could, could make it work by incentivizing in different ways, using metrics in different ways? Oh, I definitely think that there's room, there's room to look at the outcome measures and the process measures that we're doing and see what's truly meaningful and what can be improved on. I definitely think that they should be um, looked at with all these, this in mind, for sure. I definitely agree, although I would caution that while it's really, like, we always are looking at outcomes, but we've, we've reached a point in infection prevention where many of us have very low rates, so it is really hard to sort of detect a change in your rate, you know, unless it's over a really long period of time. So sometimes you're talking about a unit will have, like, one HAI in the period of a year or something like that. So sort of it can be a challenge. Um, the other piece I would add, um, I do think that that is for sure the, you know, what we should be thinking about, though, the outcomes of the patients. Um, but I do think that sometimes a disservice is done with the HCAP scores and things like that because when things are part of value-based purchasing or publicly reported in that, they become important. So I think as it, that stuff has, has put that at the forefront, you know, mm -hmm. not for the best, but that's mm -hmm. sort of the world that we live in right now. Just to further answer the, the question that you had there, in, other measurements, but that's that's why I was I, I made my my you know cry to industry. You know we if we can have a, a, a tool that helps to measure uh, contamination in areas of the hospital where it matters, critical care particularly. That you know there's a difference between um, cleaning for disinfection or you know like deep. I don't know what the, the correct terms are. I, I but. You know, you guys get what I mean. And then cleaning for patient safety. I think that there's, two, there's, they're really two different. And so, you know, maybe we would be measuring them differently. And so, um, but in your critical care areas where it's really important that we remove, you know, you're, you're, you're going to put a new patient into a room that you just had a, um, you know, contact precaution. We should be able to measure that, that that's clean. And we can't. And what does that clean mean? What's that definition? We still don't have that. Yeah, so we've uh, talked a lot about the magnitude of the uh, HAI problem, uh, and we've also connected the environment uh, directly to that problem, and you guys have talked a lot about testing. Um, how do you foresee the future of testing evolving uh, for the environment? Do you think it's ever going to be required, and you know, if so, what, what are the characteristics that uh, make it required? I do think that that's going to be on the horizon at some point because I think that more and more it's going to become more universally understood and accepted that something needs to change and, and be um, be done. Um, you know, there's problems with the culture-based me culture based methods work really, really well, but now you have to wait 24 hours before you have any confidence before you can put a patient in there. Then there's this other culture-based method that uses the ATP technology, and, and that that's a step in the right direction because it's still culture-based. Um, but uh, you now have to wait six or seven hours, so maybe you you know be, before you really have an idea. And there's still some issues with that, I think. So we are making the step in the right direction. But what about what about um, genomics? What about uh, doing you know rapid um, uh, genetic testing? Um, are are we you know maybe maybe? And I'm just I'm just brainstorming here. So you have a C diff patient. Maybe you could do a, a PCR test for for C diff. You know. And okay, we cleaned it. We ran a PCR. It takes I don't know a half an hour, hour or so. And I don't I don't know if that's logistically going to work. I'm just saying we got to start thinking, <laughs> you know. But there's there has to be a, a something, and we've got plenty of really 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 bright minds in this room, and um, we'll come up with something. Yeah, I would add to that that I, in in the sense that I expect it to be required in that when you come when you get your accreditation visit, they'll say okay, how do you assess the cleanliness of your environment? Uh, but I agree with Chris. The guideline from CDC on how to do that is, I think it was published in 2010, so there hasn't been you know, a lot of updates, and there's not a lot of options out there, especially real time. So uh, definitely we need to sort of grow the technology. I totally agree with that. And I would say I see it as a similar um, type process measure to hand hygiene, right? Hand hygiene is a process measure. 
It's not an outcome measure, and but there's a huge amount of attention paid to it. And really, um, environment cleaning it should really be seen along the similar way. It's also a process measure that leads to, to bad outcomes. But I completely agree with the rest of the panel here. I think more work needs to be done to get better, more standardized uh, methods of assessing cleanliness and disinfection before the, um, it could really be brought forward to um, reporting um, status. All right, great. With that, we'll convene this panel discussion. Can we have one more round of applause for our panel participants?